Greetings to all. A warm welcome, my dear sisters and brothers, and all who are interested in listening to this new chapter study of the attributes of God. And you know that you all are welcome. This is your pastor, Yeti. Yes, we are still in the attributes of God. But there's a lot to say about God, and I think it never stops. But anyway, today I'm going to talk about the justice of God. Our Father, we love you for your justice. We acknowledge that your judgments are true and righteous altogether. Your justice upholds the order of the universe and guarantees the safety of all who put their trust in you. We live because you are just and merciful, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, righteous in all, your ways and holy. In all your works. Amen. In the inspired scriptures, justice and righteousness are scarcely to be distinguished from each other. The same word and the original becomes, in English, justice or righteousness, almost. One would suspect at the whim of the translator. The Old Testament assessed God's justice in language clear and full and as beautiful as may be found anywhere in the literature of mankind. When the destruction of Sodom was announced, Abraham interceded for the righteous within the city, reminding God that he knew that he would act like himself in the human emergency that be far from you to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from you. Shall not the just and the judge of all the earth do right? The concept of God held by the psalmists and the prophets of Israel, was that of all and all powerful ruler, high and lifted up, reigning in equity. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne of the long-awaited Messiah, it was prophesied that when he came, he should judge the people with righteousness and the poor with judgment. Holy man of tender compassion, outraged by the iniquity of the world's rulers, prayed, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongs, 
a god to whom vengeance belonged. Shoe yourself. Lift up yourself, you judge of the earth. Render and reward to be proud. Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? And this is to be understood not as a plea for personal vengeance, but as a longing to see moral equity prevail in human society. Such men as David and Daniel acknowledge their own unrighteousness in contrast to the righteousness of God. And as a result, their penitential prayers gained great power and effectiveness. O Lord, righteousness belongs unto you, but unto you as confuses our faces. And when the long withheld judgment of God begins to fall upon the world, John sees the victorious saints standing upon a sea of glass mingled with fire. In their hands they hold harps of God. The song they sing is the song of Moses and the Lamb, and the theme of their songs is the divine justice. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty, just and through are the, your ways. You, King of Saints, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments are made manifest. Justice embodies the idea of moral equity, and inequity is the exact opposite. It is in equity, the absence of equality from human thoughts and acts. Judgment is the application of equity to moral situations and may be favorable or unfavorable according to whether the one under examination has been equitable or inequitable in heart and conduct. It is sometimes said justice requires God to do this. Referring to some acts we know he will perform. This is an error of thinking as well as of speaking, for it postulates a principle of justice outside of God, which compels him to act in a certain way. Of course, there is no such principle. If there were, it would be superior to God, for only a superior power can compel obedience. The truth is that there is not and can never be anything outside of the nature of God, which can move him in the least degree. All God's reasons come from within his uncreated being. Nothing has entered the being of God from eternity. Nothing has been removed and nothing has been changed. Justice, when used of God, is a name we give to the way God is. Nothing more. And when God acts justly, he is not doing so to conform to an independent criterion but simply acting like himself in a given situation. As gold is an element in itself and can never change nor compromises, but is gold wherever it is found. So God is God, always, only, fully God, and can never be other than he is. 
Everything in the universe is good to the degree it conforms to the nature of God and evil as it fails to do so. God is his own self-existent principle of moral equity. And when he sentences evil men or rewards the righteous, he simply acts like himself from within, uninfluenced by anything that is not himself. All this seems, but only seems, to destroy the hope of justification for the returning sinner. The Christian philosopher and saint Anselm, Archbishop of Canterbury, sought a solution to the apparent contradiction between the justice and the mercy of God. How do you spare the wicked, he required of God. If you are all just and supremely just, then he looked straight at God for the answer. But he knew that it lies in what God is. Anselm's findings may be paraphrased this way. God's being is unitary. It is not composed of a number of parts working harmoniously, but simply one. There is nothing in his justice which forbids the exercise of his mercy. To think of God as we sometimes think of a court where a kindly judge, compiled by law, sentences a man to death with tears and apologies, is to think in a manner wholly unworthy of the true God. God is never at cross purposes with himself. No attribute of God is in conflict with another. God's compassion flows out of his goodness, and goodness without justice is not goodness. God spares us because he is good, but he could not be good if he were not just. When God punishes the wicked, and so on, concludes, it is just because it is consistent with their deserts. And when he spares the wicked, it is just because it is compatible with his goodness. So God does what becomes him as a supremely good God. This is reason seeking to understand. Not that it may believe, but because it already believes. A simpler and more familiar solution for the problem of how God can be just and still justify the unjust is found in the Christian doctrine of redemption. It is that through the work of Christ in atonement, justice is not violated but satisfied when God spares a sinner. Redemptive theology teaches that mercy does not become effective toward a man until justice has done its work. The just penalty for sin was exactly when Christ, our substitute, died for us on the cross. However, unpleasant this may sound, to the ear of the natural human. It has ever been sweet to the ear of fate. Millions have been morally and spiritually transformed by this message, have lived lives of greater moral power, and died at last peacefully trusting in it. This message of justice discharged and mercy operate is more than a pleasant theological theory. It announces a fact made necessary by our deep human needs. Because of our sin, we are all under sentence of death, a judgment which results 
when justice confronted our moral situation. When infinite equity encountered our chronic and willful inequity, there was a violent war between the two, a war which God won and must always win. But when the penitent sinner cast himself upon Christ for salvation, the moral situation is reserved. I mean, is reversed. Justice confronts the changed situation and pronounces the believing human just. Thus justice actually goes over to the sight of God's trusting children. This is the meaning of those daring words of the Apostle John. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But God's justice stands forever against the sinner in utter severity. The vague and tenuous hope that God is too kind to punish the ungodly has become a deadly opiate for the consciousness for the consciences of millions. It hushes their fears and allows them to practice all pleasant forms of iniquity while that draws every day nearer and the command to repent goes unregarded. As responsible moral beings, we dare not so strive with our eternal future. I will end with repeating again the meaning of justice. It was given through the Apostle John. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But God's justice stands forever against the sinner in utter severity. My dear ones, every attribute of God, the knowledge of the holy, is the most important part of our life to see that God will never change that he does not have to do anything to produce another attribute but it is God himself in himself that gives us all the aspect of who he is. And for ourselves, I think we, we have to know to coming to an understanding that we need those words that comes to us to having a better image of who God is for us and for the world. I think that's why we give names to God to give us as human beings a better understanding to come better to our hearts and soul to come better to our minds to bring it deeper down in ourselves a beautiful people let the indwelling of the Holy Spirit unfold you Let him show you 
that God is the God of everything. That the God in himself is the God who will never change. And that he is the one who will always do just and always be merciful. Let him help you to walk your path. I pray that for all of us in Jesus' name. May God bless your hearts and soul. May you give peace and mind and heart. This is your Pastor Yeti. Bye.